God has the finger of God, the arm of God, and the right hand of God. Let me read you some scriptures. The finger of God, God used when he wrote the tablets, the Ten Commandments on the mountain. He, used, he only used his finger. Isaiah 48, 13. Let's turn there. I'm going to be reading this from the Amplified. Do you want to be used? How many in this room want to be used? Did you hear what the Lord said? Stop the wicked talk. It's wicked to say, I'm nothing, I'm no one. Stop that talk, that foolishness. And don't rehearse in your heart all the reasons why you can't be chosen by the Lord. Tell the Lord all those things. But stop getting them so ingrained in your heart, all the things you can't do. None of us can do anything. Have you come to that realization yet? It's only by the grace and the hand of God that we can do anything. Isaiah 48, 13. Surely my hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Scientists have discovered that the universe is growing bigger. It's not decreasing. It's growing and increasing. Why would that be? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. For one thing, God's showing off to us that he's omniscient, omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He has all power. He can do anything he wants. There's a scripture that says, I am the Lord. I can do anything I want. But he always does righteousness. He's trying to tell human beings, look, this is how big I am that I can even go on creating more universes. They're never ending. And perhaps the second reason, you know, we have finite intelligence, we only know a little bit, is that God will send us to some of those universes. Who knows? Maybe we'll be a king or ruler over one of those universes. I don't know. But knowing God, <laughs> he has great things for us to do. I've read that people in heaven, one of the exploits that they ask for is to go to other places and perform exploits. What that means, God only knows. Isaiah 64, 8, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and all of us are the work of your hands. Could we please consider and conceive that we're just clay in God's hands? He can form us. If you've got something wrong with you, as we all do, we've all got something, God can create us and reform us into the person we ought to be. Don't put God in a box that he's too small that he can't change us. He can change anybody. If I told you my testimony of before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'd be horrified. You'd be horrified. All the stupid antics. Even after I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I did stupid things because I had so much zeal and no much and no wisdom. God can change anybody. That's what I'm trying to say. I want you to go to Second Kings, but there's qualifications. Let's go to Second Kings 18. I want you to see some of the qualifications. It's always about character. It's always about honesty and integrity and the love walk. Second Kings 18. Hezekiah is one of my favorite kings, one of God's favorite kings, too. Now, it came to pass in the third year of Hosea that the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. I want you to think back to yourself at 25. What were you doing? Did you have it together at 25? I was trying desperately to get it together. I'd had the baptism. But still, my goodness, what we don't know when we're 25. Think about it. So he's now become king 
at 25, verse 3. And I want us to see his character, what he did to be favored among one of the greatest kings of Israel. The Bible says of, of all time. What did he do to qualify himself? There's things we have to do to qualify. There's favor. We all have the favor of the Lord because we're under grace. But then there's extreme favor from God. And let me point to a, a case in point, Reinhard Bonnke. He got how many million saved? Does anybody remember? How many? Yeah, I, I think... 70 million, 50 million, millions, millions. But do you know how he started out and what he was faithful doing? He went out on the street and he preached. He was a street corner preacher and he preached the gospel. I'm sure he had people throw rotten eggs at him and name call him and do all manner of things. He was faithful in preaching on the street, in cold weather, in hot weather, whatever it took, he was faithful. Faithfulness is one of the things that God counts oh so much. And because Reinhard Bonnke was faithful and always true to his cause, an evangelist, God took him to Africa where he got millions saved at one time. That could be any one of us. It could be any one of us because of faithfulness. So we want to see what King Hezekiah, what his character was like, for God to favor him so highly that he called him the greatest king in Israel. Verse 3, we're going to find one thing right here. Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. If only people realized we live within the sight of the Lord. Do you have that sensation in your life where you see the Lord looking at you at all times? Do you have that? How many do? How many of you have that sensation? I do. And sometimes, I mean, he and I are looking at each other. I can feel him. I can sense him. Learn to feel the Lord. Learn to sense your heavenly father. Learn to know when it's your heavenly father talking to you and looking at you and sensing you and you're zoning into him or whether it's Jesus Christ or whether it's the Holy Spirit. Learn that. When it's my heavenly father, I know exactly it's him. And the minute his spirit touches me, I immediately give him my full attention. Learn to do this with God. You give him your full attention. One of those ways this comes into focus more is by fasting. Fasting is one of the greatest tools for getting close to God. If you're kind of a dullard, you think of yourself, well, I'm just not really with it when it comes to perceiving God. Start doing some fasting. Leave off a meal here and there. We're not saying go on a 40-day fast immediately. A life on fire. But start fasting. Leave off meals and ask God to set your heart on fire for him. Do you pray this? God, I'm kind of a sluggard right now. Set my heart on fire for you. How many of you pray that? Set my heart on fire for you. My fire has gone out. Set my heart on fire for you. So the Lord, so Hezekiah always did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I don't know whether he perceived the Lord, but he knew the Lord was always watching him. The Lord's always watching us. But what I'm saying is not fear that, but tune into his glance. Tune into his presence. When you feel the Lord, his presence watching you, tune into him and make it a rapport. Respond to him. Talk to him. Worship him. So he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He knew the Lord was always watching him. You know, we could look at this in the negative way. Oh, he's always watching me. You know, I better not, better not kick the cat. No, let's look at it in the positive sense. He's always watching us 
So we know we have his favor. So we know he's in love with us. The Lord's in love with you. And let's love him back. Love the Lord back at all times. <laughs> so he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He was always aware of the sight of the Lord. According to all that his father David had done. How many of you had good fathers? Had a great father. I still hear my father's admonitions ringing in my heart. One of them was, he would say to us, a good name is all you really have in life. Protect it. I can remember him saying that. Your name, a good name is all you really have in life. Protect it. Ruth, you probably heard that from somebody too. So you don't take advantage of people. You don't slander people. You watch your character. It's all about character with God. It's all about character. God wants us. We're, we're made in the image of Christ. We know that. But then there's participating with the Lord's character in life. Jesus is kind. So then we're kind to people. We're kind to people. We're loving to people. With all of our fiber of our being, as much as is within us, we try to be kind to people. We don't always make it. I don't always make it. Do you? But that's one of our goals is to be kind to people, be loving to people. We have long suffering with people. I get in trouble all the time because I'm too long suffering. People take advantage of me because of the long suffering nature. But there's a value to be long suffering with people. You hang in with them when you think that you can help them. You can help them. And then you do help them and they kick you in the face. So what? They did worse to the master. We're long suffering with people because Jesus is long suffering with us. It's character that God is looking at. So his father David taught him the right way to go and Hezekiah did not depart from it. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke to pieces the bronze servant that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it. So what he's saying, what this verse is saying is, Hezekiah worshipped no one or nothing, not money, not gold, not success, Some people run after success. I want to tell you a story. Someone I knew years ago, he was, his big God was success and money. That's what empowered him, success and money. And all the days that I knew him, he ran after success and money. And he was huge on the earth. He was famous. He was huge on the earth. He had charisma like you wouldn't believe. Everything he touched turned to gold. He came into a, a small congregation, our congregation at that time. It was uh, probably about, I don't know, maybe 100 people, 90 people. And he raised $40,000 because of charisma. I told him, "Take. I don't want you to work the people for money. You just give them the word and you let them give. You know, 10 minutes max. I don't like to work people for money. It's not right. Teach the word, preach the word, but you don't try to work the people for money. That's wrong. That's merchandising the anointing. So I said, you know, make it 10 minutes. Well, he took about a 40-minute minute offering and he worked the people like crazy. And the offering was $40,000 from a little congregation. That's wrong. Do you think that $40,000 merited him anything in the kingdom of God? No, it was all burned up. It was all burned up. For one thing, he wasn't in obedience to the pastor. The pastor said, don't work the people. The pastor said, don't take a long offering. Just tell the people the word and allow them to give. That $40,000 was burned up. It, was just, it wasn't registered in heaven. In fact, he got a detriment that day. He got a minus sign with the Lord instead of a plus sign because he wasn't obedient to the head of the church, the local church. Jesus is the head of the church. 
but the pastor's the under shepherd and he wasn't obedient. So he got a minus, not a plus. So my sister and I watched him over the years. One time we had to tell him something. He had African death masks in his office. Now we've studied extensively the occult and occult things. And we know that those objects, they're taken to the witch doctor and demonic energy is put into them and they exude demonic energy. Is it too much for the Lord? Of course not. It's no big deal to the Lord. My sister went to New York for business. One time we were in business and led by the Lord. She went to New York. She had to chair a huge meeting, probably 2,000, maybe 3,000 people. And so they offered to let her stay in a very famous man, I won't say the name, his townhouse, his apartment, high-rise apartment. And so she was up in this high-rise apartment in New York City, and she walks in, and there's African death masks on the wall. And so she closes the door, gets ready for bed, and there were knocks at the door. She goes to the door, there's nobody there. Closes the door, opens the door, there's nobody there. Well, we've been enough around this stuff that we know that it's the occult. So she called us in at home, and she said, pray with me, we've got to bind the power on these African death masks, because they're bugging me and won't let me go to sleep. So my mother and my sister and I bound the power of the devil. That's all it is, is the power of the devil. And so they never knocked at the door again because the highest name in the universe is the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to bow to the name. And they did bow. So she went peacefully to sleep and she had a wonderful evening and a wonderful night's sleep and did her meeting the next day. So we knew about African death masks, various things of the occult. So when we went into his office in another state, my sister and I said to him, do you not know that these are African death masks and they're taken to the witch doctors and they're cursed, especially to come against Christians? And he poo-pooed us and said, oh, you know, he liked the fact of what? What did he like about those death masks? Some of them looked like, I can't swear to it, but looked like they were the faces of real people that had just been cut out in death and put up on that wall. And I believe they were. So we warned him. We said, it'll affect your life. It'll affect your family. And most of all, it's going to affect your children. It's going to hurt your kids. He poo-pooed us like we were ignoramuses. He knew it all. He had this great ministry. He was known all over the nation. He was famous. He was very wealthy. And so he let my sister and I know that what we were saying was stupid, puerile, of no account. So I warned the wife and I said, watch out. It's going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your life. It's going to affect your ministry if you don't do something about it. She couldn't do anything because he wouldn't hear of it. People are stupid who turn a deaf ear to the things of the Spirit of God. People come along and tell me they're an, an expert or a quasi-expert in an area. I'm going to listen to them. So we went our way. We didn't see him much after that. We did see him one other time, and it was a little later in time. And so we had it deeply in our hearts to warn him about his children because we knew by the Spirit of God that his children were going to go off, off spiritually. So we asked him, we were over at, at their house in another, they had a, a second house. We were at the second house out on the lake, and we asked him if we could talk to him, and he said yes. And so he went and got some sunglasses, because we were outside on a deck, and the sunglasses had are the kind where you can't see the eyes, you know what I mean? They're buffed over or whatever, they have a film, you can't see the eyes. So he sat in a chair, and my sister and I sat in a chair, and we talked to him about an hour, an hour and a half with scripture. And then we realized that he was sound asleep. 
sound asleep. And that's why he put on those sunglasses. So he wouldn't hear the word of the Lord on that. He wouldn't hear the word of the Lord when I said, don't, don't try to pressure the people into money. He wouldn't hear the word of the Lord on that. He wouldn't hear the word of the Lord on the death masks. So one time we saw him. You see, it depends upon what we're going after. Are you going after fame and money? Are you going after fame? That's the stupidest thing in the world to go after. Now, if you're going after fame with the Lord, that's different. <laughs> if you're going after favor with the Lord, that's entirely different. So another time we were watching a certain Christian program, and there were two men at the podium talking, two very famous men. One especially was very famous. Won't mention the names. And we see them, and we're listening to their conversation. And then the camera pans... And we see our friend over there. Let's call him Joe. We see Joe sitting over on the couches way over at the right. Just, uh, he's not, he's obscured from the camera, shall we say. And then it hones in on the two people talking, the two men talking. And then a few minutes later, another pan, pan of the camera. And now Joe has moved up to some chairs over here. We think, hmm, that's interesting. Then it zones in on the two men talking. Then another pan of the camera. And now Joe has moved directly behind so he can be seen in the camera. Would you ever do that? Would you ever do that in your life? Who cares if you're seen on the camera? Just so you're seen by Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Ghost. So then it hones in on these two people again. And then all of a sudden, Joe goes from sitting behind them to coming right up into their personal conversation and discussion on the camera. Between the two men, he stands and butts in, horns in, so he can be a part of that conversation. I couldn't believe it. Now, what was this man after? Was he after the favor of Jesus? Of God the Father? No, no. He was after being seen by man. Who cares about being seen by man? William Seymour, who was part of the Azusa Street revival, he would wear, wear over his head a box, an apple crate, so that he wouldn't be seen. And the Spirit of God would fall magnificently because he didn't care about being seen. I've thought about that so many times. I'd love to wear an apple crate. I would love it. For one thing, you don't have to do your hair. You don't have to do your makeup. No, that's not why. But I think that would be magnificent. And as long as he kept the apple crate on because he didn't care about being seen, he didn't care about fame before men. Do you care about fame before men? Does it even titillate you? It repulses me. Does it repulse you? I can't stand it. As long as he kept the apple crate on, there were miracles that happened in the congregation because all he cared about was Jesus Christ's approval. Listen, we've got to have a big heart change. That's all we can care about is the approval of Jesus Christ. And God the Father, that he will put his hand upon us for his pleasure, for what he wants to do in our lives. That's what we care about. We don't care about man. We don't care about success. We don't care about fame. So this man, the three times that we had the word of the Lord for him, he denied it, made it devoid of power as far as he was concerned. You know when you've got the word of the Lord for somebody. You just know. It just almost eats you alive until you release it. So, over the years, then we lost track of them because they live in another state. We've lost track of them. And finally, we caught up with the wife just uh, a couple weeks ago. And I asked how her husband was doing. And she said, oh, he's had a stroke. He can't talk. Very well, hardly. He can't use his, I think it's his right arm and his leg drags. Now, you tell me if running after the success of men was worth it for him. He violated all kinds of principles in the word of God. 
I'll say it over and over and over. We live by the principles of God's word. We don't live for the approval of men. We don't live for the, for the fame. We don't live for fame. We don't live for money. Those things God told us, I mean, money to God is like nothing. His glory is what counts. So now this man, was there a payback? Because his focus wasn't Jesus Christ. I can attest to that, knowing him. He was our best friend years ago. I can attest to it. There was always something in him that was after acclaim. Fame, acclaim, approval of men, money, success. Those things are like dung before God. And so now look at him. He got his reward because his eyesight was skewered. His focus was not on Jesus. It was on things that are <laughs> nothing, is nothing at all. Another case in point. Uh, years ago, when I was just uh, probably 20, had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I went to a meeting in downtown Portland, and there was a certain minister there. I was on the third row. For some reason, I got... Maybe I was there early. I don't remember. I was on the third row. This man was so powerful. It's a man you all know. Was so powerful. The anointing of him was so strong that as I sat on the third row, it overcame me to the point of, you know, when the anointing comes upon you, you just, you're in bliss. You're in heaven. His anointing was so incredibly strong. I, I, I was in awe. I'd never felt, I hadn't been to Brother Hagen yet. I hadn't felt that kind of anointing. I'm just, uh, you know, a year old in the baptism or something. And his anointing was incredible. Now, fast forward. And he had a large church. Now, fast forward. Everything's about character and godliness with God and obedience to his principles in his word. Fast forward. Uh, he made a mistake. He took a misstep. He did something morally wrong. His character was besmirched before the world. You know, if we get off in character, God will pull our pants down, so to speak. In other words, he will let our shame be seen to all. So he made a fatal step. He did something wrong, and everybody knew about it. It was blazed abroad. After that, uh, I moved to Tulsa. And my mother and I were traveling. We used to travel in the South because we were living in the South. So we'd go all over traveling. And so we happened to go to his church. And I'm telling you, there was no anointing. There wasn't even an anointing. He had no anointing. This was after his character flaw. Now, you can make a mistake with God and you can ask forgiveness and get yourself picked up and get right. But there's something I've watched over these years. <coughs> People who have huge ministries and they're really, God favors them with huge anointings and huge gifts. When they make a character flaw or they have a character flaw and they allow it to go into sin. So, Everybody has character problems. I'm not saying any of us are perfect. I'm talking about something that is hugely inappropriate, sinful, wrong in the sight of God, against his word. So people who have, that I've watched over the years, who have huge anointings, great gifts of the Spirit flowing. I mean, they just look like giants. When they make a character flaw like that and don't repent or don't get their character back where it should be, they never rise, ever, ever rise to what they were before. I've watched it. They never, there's no comeback for them. This man didn't fully repent. Now, I don't know what he did later, but in the news, he didn't fully repent. Uh, he has now, but he's never come back to where he was. And so we had occasion to see him recently. He doesn't even preach anymore. He just takes up offerings. 
I want you to let that sink in. He made a mistake. And he's never risen to the place of the anointing that he had. Well, what's the answer then? Okay, look at Hezekiah. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He was always aware of God's sight on him. According to all that his father, his godly, godly father, David, had taught him. He removed the high places. He wouldn't allow the people to serve other gods. He didn't serve other gods. A god is success, fame, and fortune. Those are gods before Jesus. Popularity. Those are gods. Now look at verse 5. He trusted in the Lord of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Do you see what this is saying? No one was like Hezekiah because he trusted in the Lord. Verse 6, he held fast to the Lord. He didn't hold fast to fame. He didn't hold fast to popularity. He held fast to the Lord. You always got to have your arms around Jesus' neck, so to speak. You always got to be hugging the Lord. Lord, I got to have more of you. I want more of you. Give me more of you. Set me on fire for you. I'm in love with you, but I got to have more love. You've got to set my heart ablaze so that I'm so crazy in love with you. I just can't stand doing anything wrong. I just want you, Lord. He held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. Do you know how many people don't follow the Lord? They may say they love him, but they don't follow him. I want to tell you a story. Can you give me five minutes? I told you this story before. These stories that you see in people's lives are worth a million bucks, a billion, a billion dollars to you spiritually because you learn from them. I had a dear friend years ago. He was a beautiful evangelist. He was married to a woman and he had two children. Well, along came a beautiful babe, beautiful woman. And she seduced him emotionally. She seduced him with her eyes. And so he was in the ministry. He was well known in the ministry. He had a beautiful, gorgeous ministry. She seduced him. He left his wife. He left his children and divorced his wife. And he married her and they moved to another state. Now, I had an open vision one day, and I saw him. And as long as he was married to her, he went nowhere. Nowhere in the ministry, nowhere spiritually, nothing. In the meantime, his wife got on drugs, both his kids got on drugs, hardcore drugs, because they couldn't cope without a father in the house. What their father had done, they couldn't cope with it. They All, all three of them, his family, at home, got on drugs. I had an open vision, and I saw he and Jesus walking side by side, just like two partners, because that's what we are. We're in partnership with Jesus, two buddies. Jesus is your best buddy. I saw them walking together in perfect harmony, and the man was known all over for his great ministry. And then I saw the juncture. I saw the beautiful woman come, and his eyes went to her and not Jesus and he went off with her and left Jesus standing there. Jesus stood there and waited for him. I want you to see this picture. Jesus stood there. Jesus didn't move. He stayed right in that place where the man had left him. And with all of his heart, Jesus prayed for him and beckoned to him and gave him words to come back to him. Return to me. Return to your first love. Come back to me. Jesus pled with him in the spirit, to come back to Jesus, to himself. The man just wanted the woman. He didn't want Jesus anymore. And he stayed with the woman, let's say, a couple years. May have been three years. Let's say a couple years he stayed with that woman. His family at home is now all on drugs because they're brokenhearted, what their dad did. Jesus stood right there. Finally, the woman jilts him for another man. 
and walks off with another man and goes and divorces him and marries another man. This was, I think, her fourth marriage. Finally, the man walks slowly back to Jesus. And when I saw Jesus, Jesus hadn't budged. He was still standing there wanting the man to come back to him. Finally, the man came back to Jesus broken, in anguish, so disheveled and so broken apart, now only God could heal him. God did heal him, but he never again rose to where he was before. Character matters with God. Character matters with God. But Jesus never left the spot where the man left off, and then Jesus walked with him, and the man slowly walked with him, but the man never regained the height that he was with Jesus. Not because Jesus didn't want it, because now the man was so fractured and so apart and was, had so defiled himself that it was taking him a long time to get himself together again with the help of the Lord. The Lord will always bring us back. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? It's all about character with Jesus. So here, look at Hezekiah's life. He clung to the Lord. He held fast to the Lord. One translation said he clung to him. Are you clinging to the Lord? And because of that, he held fast to the Lord. He clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following Jesus. Jesus said, you turn right, you turn right. You don't turn left. You don't go straight, you turn right. And kept his commandments. You keep every principle in the body of, in this, in this book, the Bible. And the Lord was with him and prospered him wherever he went. Now that's prosperity when the Lord prospers you. That's true prosperity. Because he prospers our soul, he prospers our life, our heart, our mentality, our families, and he prospers us financially. Do you see it? Follow the Lord. Cling to him. Make him your first love. Never let him go. And if you don't have fire and if you don't have love, leave off meals and start praying for the fire. 